Urban Agriculture, episode number two, the second green revolution. You're listening to Urban Agriculture, episode number two, recorded on March 25th, 2014. Hello, everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent. Good morning, Dixon. How are you? Um, bright and chipper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> still cold. Yeah, it's, it's still cold out here. It's freezing outside. It's going to snow later today. What is going on? It's almost the end of March. Yeah, I heard we're having a snowstorm. <laughs> My goodness. What's yep. going on? Global, um, global warming? No, not really. This is a typical spring, basically. We've had a typical winter, but people are not used to it because we haven't had too many typical winters over the last 10 right. years, let's say. It, but you have to deal with it. You know, a lot of people are bothered by it, but I don't they care. Are. I just go about my normal you life. You have to do what you right? got to do. I have to podcast. I have to do research. Today I did an experiment. You know? That's very good. What What was the experiment about? Now, this is agriculture. No, no one listening wants to know about virology. Oh, uh, but they want to know about this one because this is a waterborne. They can infection. go to uh, they can go to this week in virology to that's hear right. all about that. That's right. That's right. So this is at, at Dixon, our second episode. Yes, we haven't even posted the first as no. we record this because um, well, we will. I have to do a little, a few technical things. Uh, I'm planning to do it this weekend, okay. assuming I get the website built and the right. artwork done. Right. Right. Well, you're, which is not trivial, Doctor Day. You know, you're doing the heavy lifting here, Vince, and all I'm doing is talking. That's fine. You are the expert. <laughs> this is your show. I'm here mm. to facilitate. You are, and you do, and great to job. ask questions. That's right. I want to learn so that someday well, I can be a an farmer. Urban farmer. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so, where was I that I heard? Of all, all these troubles about food. I don't know. Everyone's well, talking about it. Oh, you know who sent me? You know, Dave Frigursky, our old friend, yeah, sent yeah, me a link one. I got one. to an article that's about right. something happening here in New York City. Yeah, 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 yeah that's right. It's a BBC uh, demonstration. We'll get to that in a future episode, probably. Sure, absolutely. All right. So last time we talked a lot about the first green revolution. That's right. Right? The invention of farming. Right. And then we morphed into the second well, we haven't quite done that. That's what this episode is all about. Oh, we didn't? I thought yeah. we finished the second last time. No, no, no. We well, still, we're still working on getting the first Green Revolution into the second Green Revolution. So remind us. I will. What started the second? So let's go back 12,000 years ago. No farms. 10,000 years ago, early farms, all the way up to, well, the Industrial Revolution. So up to that point, people farmed traditionally in the sense that they used draft animals to plow they used draft animals to pull out the stumps, to clear the land, to make room for farms as the populations began to expand. But the Industrial Revolution really jump-started a lot of things, including farming. And, of course, there were some social upheavals associated with this as well. Everybody knows the history of the Industrial Revolution, basically the discovery of oil, the uh, invention of a combustion engine, and the diesel engine. Those were two things that happened almost simultaneously. Oil was first discovered in Poland, believe it or not, in 1854, mm. later on in, in uh, Pennsylvania in 1859, and in Titusville, Pennsylvania. And the next thing you knew, people were finding a use for this new found, what we now call fossil fuel. Okay, before that we were using steam engines and uh, that sort of thing, and wind to, to, to power the uh, boats that we were sailing across the ocean. All the trains were steam engines, there were no... Uh, Fossil fuel, uh, but coal, that, that's not true. Fossil fuels for coal to generate steam to make the you trains mean, move. You mean, you mean petroleum-derived fuels? Yeah, but w wood was used too. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but so so it, trains were in existence before uh, but of course. the and discovery of oil. And some steam-powered cars but, uh, and some steam-powered tractors, which were very, very heavy and very mm -hmm. clumsy mm -hmm. and got stuck in mud and springs and all that stuff. So fast forward to the invention of the combustion engine and dynamite. Yeah, that's by Alfred Nobel, that's, that's right. right. And so we could clear land fast, and we could right. now plant anywhere we wanted, as long as there was a, a viable soil to do it. And it, it, when the Cumberland Gap was discovered, by Daniel Boone, by the way, and the entire Midwest was opened up to uh, the settlers, that was the region that became colonized with farming, 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 because... Cumberland Gap. Cumberland Gap. Where is that? Cumberland Gap, I'm going to really stick my neck out here. I believe it's in Tennessee. 
it's part of the Appalachian. So that was a way to get over the mountains to the west. Yeah, You're because before that, that they were farming uh, in the Piedmont, of course, down the coast of um, of the United States, the early United States. But the New England farmers ran into big trouble. Kentucky. Kentucky. Sorry about that, Kentucky. That's where the Daniel Boone is from. through the mountains into the wilderness of Kentucky. There you go. And it was discovered by? Daniel Boone. As you that's said. Right. That's right. And he he... He showed the way for people to find an easy passage from the east to the Midwest. It is uh, in the Cumberland. It's a pass through the Cumberland Mountains, right? Which is uh, near the junction of Tennessee, Kentucky, and Virginia. See, that's I wasn't altogether. Wrong. I was in Virginia last week. <coughs> Were you really? Whereabouts? I was in Blacksburg, which is right. Oh yeah. There, there's oh, yeah. two mountain ranges surrounding it, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's actually in a little valley. Yep. The Blue Mountains on one side, and nice. I don't know what's on the other. But Maybe the Shenandoahs. And it's about 3,000 feet elevation there. Right. At Blackbird. It's very pretty. It's kind of it's on very a pretty. plateau. Very and, pretty. Uh, they don't get much snow. Or visitors. <laughs> no, they have the big college, Virginia Tech. They have oh, like I do know that. 40,000 or more. One of our most students. illustrious ecologists taught there, John Cairns. They have a big sports program and all that stuff. You know? Yep, they Sorry. do. They do. But they're also... Very interested in the ecology and the effects of farming on ecology. So we'll be talking about that in future shows. So, right, so we moved through the Cumberland Gap. We, we went west. There was right. lots of land out there, and obviously. What, what was discovered was this was all the floodplains from all the rivers that drained into the Mississippi. Fertile. Very fertile. Alluvial, right? Alluvial. I know that word. Good. What does alluvial mean? <laughs> it means deposited by water. So the water flows over the plains, deposits. Yep. It takes it from the mountains, and then as it slows down, the sediments start to fall out, and then the next thing you know, if you have a flood, all that sediment goes up. And by the way, that's what jump-started farming to begin with. So people looked at this and said, I could farm this? Not only did they say that, they did it. And they became the breadbasket of America, basically. Wheat? Uh, mostly grains. Uh, Corn? Some wheat, it depends. Uh, if it wasn't in the grasslands, of course, if they had to clear uh, mm -hmm. hardwood forests, then the crops that they uh, chose were corn <clears throat> and some other crops like that. And they were feeding basically the heavily populated areas of the East. All right. So the West hadn't yet <coughs> developed. The no, we were, that was uh, later in the 1800s. And the, by the way, that was the claim that we, as our population grew, we of course needed that land, and therefore we took it away from the people that owned it, and that was uh, the kind Native of a bad Americans, thing for us yeah. to do also. Yeah, right. So those were the grasslands. The grasslands were sort of uh, west of the Mississippi, mm -hmm. and the fertile <clears throat> bottomlands for all those rivers: the Ohio River, the Tennessee River, the Mississippi. Uh, those rivers drained into the Mississippi at, at about the junction of where St. Louis is now. And all of that land was then um, converted from hardwood forest <clears throat> into what we now know as the breadbasket of the Midwest. You know, I have this <coughs> sense that I should be looking at a map of the U.S. as you're talking because, <laughs> you know, I don't get around. Well, that's not true. I do well, get, around, get around a lot. But when you fly, you don't see very much. No, you don't. But what you do see is a lot of squares. I'll tell you, when I flew out there a couple of years ago, it was all brown squares. That's right. That's very, right. very yeah, And then yeah, there's yeah, squares, yeah. but then there are big circles, too. There are some of those, too. What are the circles? Well, you, still, you'll tell us later. Well, yeah, we'll get to that because we'll, we'll get into the modern farming practices. Okay. I'm speaking as though I'm a farmer, but uh, You're not. the listeners know that I'm not. You're a parasitologist. <clears throat> I'm a parasitologist converted to <laughs> what? the larger scale view of what's happening to our planet, basically. And I'm, I'm a macro ecologist, basically. You, move, you want to move about. farming to the urban environment. Well, not all of it, but uh, we'll talk about not that. Not all of it? No, not all of it. You can't do it. It's just not going to work. But enough to make a difference in terms of repairing Earth's damaged ecosystems. And that's basically where I'm coming from. We're going to be talking a lot more a about lot this. About we'll this is just the beginning. It. This is the beginning. So of a we very should tell subject. our listeners to be patient. We need to get through Absolutely. this introductory <laughs> stuff, which is mainly for me, so that I understand. No, it's for everybody. It's it's really for me too. This, it's, it's, this it, is only going to be listened to by me. I <laughs> I hope that's not the case, because then we can turn off the mics and just have a conversation. But to be honest with you, um, I need to, and I'm always honest with you, by the way. So I don't mean <laughs> to use that as an introductory phrase, but. Um, what I what I want to do is really summarize uh, common knowledge with regards to where farming came from, where it is today, and, and where it might be going if things don't change okay. with regards to technology. So the West was opened up, <clears throat> lots of plains, up, farming. Dynamite, 
combustion engine tractors mm-hmm. that were diesel powered. And in fact, the earliest tractors designed by Henry Ford mm-hmm. were not diesel powered. They were ethanol powered. Where did the ethanol come from? It came from the farm. Really? From, yeah. From so, corn? So the way they envisioned this is that a section of the farm would be set aside huh. for fuel production and the rest of it for food production. And the, and the corn was used to make ethanol? That's correct. So the current practice, today we're using a lot of corn for ethanol, right? We are. We're right back to where we started. I, I thought this was something new. So you're saying this has been around a long no, time. No, it was around a long time. In fact, that was the original wow. envisioning of how to, how to fuel efficiently yeah. these uh, tractors. early tractors. So they ran on 100%? Yep. Wow. They did. And what happened to that idea? We got cheap gas instead. Uh, we won't. Uh, there is a controversy and a conspiracy theories all over the place as to what happened next uh, because the Volstead Act was passed. And what did that say? And that said you can't consume alcohol over, I believe it was 3.2% or something of that. Oh, is that the prohibition? The Volstead yeah. Act. Yeah, yeah, it's the yeah, right yeah, name yeah, for yeah, prohibition. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, but that, in, my, in my view, doctor, professor, yes, de Pommier, yes. it was a dumb act. We all agree because they repealed it. But, but in the meantime, <gasps> all of the engines that used 100% ethanol now had to convert to something else. Because of the Volstead Act? Yeah, because you weren't So you couldn't, to, not only you couldn't drink it, but you couldn't put it in your tractor? Well, you couldn't have it. It was oh, a prohibited substance. This is crazy. This is crazy. Well, and the, what about cars? Uh, why didn't they use ethanol initially? Uh, some did, but the original motor uh, was not a uh, an internal combustion engine as we know it. It was a diesel. <clears throat> was Mr. Henry Ford alive at the time of the Volstead Act? He was very much alive. I'm surprised that he allowed this to be passed. You would think he would have a lot of power. Right? Well, he had a lot of friends who disagreed with the ethanol uh, road um, down which we were driving. Was this an incentive for him to develop uh, gasoline-powered motors? Well, I believe that he, if he didn't, he would have been left in the dust, so yeah, to speak. Interesting. Okay, so the point is that I think there's more bang for your buck, so to speak, from, a, let's say, a liter of gasoline than there is from a liter of ethanol. Dixon, we have a decidedly U.S.-centric discussion here. What's happening in the rest of the world? We do. Uh, well, I mean, we shouldn't be U.S.-centric. That's true. So. For the rest of the world, I mean, you can divide the rest of the world into two parts, basically. You can have the industrialized rest of the world and the mm-hmm. non-industrialized rest of the world. But they're farming also. You know, right? Everybody has to farm. So everybody has to farm. So the non-industrial portion of the world, that is sub-Saharan Africa for the most part, most of Southeast Asia, most of South Asia, mm-hmm. most of China, uh, and many other places throughout the world as well, they use traditional farming methods with human labor. Okay, mm-hmm. but because there were so many people involved in farming, it wasn't a problem to, to provide enough food for everybody, and that was true even during the wars. What about uh, Europe? Europe is an industrialized portion, so the food from that sector came primarily from uh, at least mechanized farming practices. Okay, so you had tractors and you had planters and you had weeders and harvesters mm-hmm. and packers and all these other machineries that, that arose as the result of the Industrial Revolution. So is it fair to say that the development of farming in Europe, Europe paralleled that in the U.S.? That's correct. Did they use ethanol, for example? Uh, no, I believe that they used diesel engines. And in fact, the, I see. the, uh, the most successful tractor that Henry Ford produced was a diesel-powered uh, vehicle right. as well. So they did not, of course, pass the Volstead Act. No, they did not. Because they were wise. <laughs> That's where all the uh, U.S. Um, alcohol-consuming public that could afford it went during Prohibition. Where they shipped it over here, of course. Uh, yeah. Well, that was another story, of course. Uh, so a lot of people got rich during that. <laughs> yeah, that organized crime got very strong. That's right. Made That's a lot right. of money. That's correct. So it was a foolish act in retrospect. Yeah. Um, Remember, it's an agricultural product. <laughs> what, what, what's the per- point of that, Dr. DePont? Well, because agriculture plays a role in a lot of things, not just the food production s- s- uh, scene that we're yeah. going to be talking about. So it's about. made from grains, right? It's made from grains, and so is uh, scotch, and so is rye whiskey. Yeah, beer. It's called rye whiskey for a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Barley. Uh, there's a very beautiful song by Sting called Golden Fields of uh, Barley, mm-hmm. and uh, that's all about the production of beer and uh, whiskey. Hmm. All right, I'm sorry for the little diversion, no, but that's you're okay, going to have to get uh, used to that. It's because interesting to realize how, I have how deep into culture, no matter where you go, agriculture uh, is embedded. 
people take it for granted, you know. That's the problem. So even he, for for sure here in the U, in the New York City, yeah, no one even thinks about where their food is coming from. Mm, but some people, do, some people do. Of course, there's always a minority. Them, they Most know don't. where they come from. It comes from the grocery, grocery store. store. <laughs> right. But if you go, even if you go into the suburbs, people yeah. still don't really That's think right. much. That's they take right. a lot of things for granted. Electricity, they don't this think about true. where it comes from. You know, gasoline. but it's interesting uh, since you've mentioned that because I grew up in a little town in northern New Jersey, Dumont, New Jersey. Okay, and, and when I was a kid back in the 50s, living in New Jersey, there were still farms. And one of the big farms yeah. there was called D'Angelo's Farm. And it was right, not just down the block, but it was within a bicycle ride from my house. I grew up in North Jersey. We had Tice's Farm. Tice's they Farm, They used sure. to have Absolutely. apples and you'd go there it's in the there. fall. And you, no, they sold it and they made a mall. They made a well, shopping mall. Well, there is something there that every and fall to, they have a you celebration. You used to be able to go get cider. They would have That's taps. Right. Can That's you imagine right. having taps today, <laughs> pouring cider with a cup? No, nobody would allow this. That's Too right. Too dangerous. E. coli 0157, oh, et cetera. <laughs> you, you know, I don't necessarily pine for the old days, but yeah, there yeah, were some yeah. aspects that were quite nice. Yeah, this is true. There's a, there's a romantic past to the American agricultural scene that people hearken back to. They, they look at Courier and Ives prints and think that's the way the world should be. Well, at one time, well, farmers always work hard, but before they Very were they were made into these huge agro conglomerates, yeah, they yeah. were family run. This is true. Some, many of them still are, by the way, Vincent. We'll really? get to that. Okay. Because we'll we'll see what happened. Okay? Oh, this is going to be fun. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I like farming. I mean, well, you everybody. Know, my, my does. wife's uncle yes. was a farmer in really? Calgary. See that Canada. Calgary? Wow, that's big. He had, wheat and hay he had thousands of acres. Wheat and hay. Is that what he did? There are a million dollar hay farms up there. So he now leases it to Fantastic. sharecroppers, I guess. Really? Are they still a little near Calgary? Do you know what they grow? Uh, I would guess hay and wheat. Canola. Really? That's it's it. It's a cash crop. It's a big cash, cash crop. crop. Big canola. Cash crop. You drive through the area, yeah. acres yeah. and acres of canola to make oils to fry things. <laughs> 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 they also raise pigs up there. Right. No, I, I do a lot of fishing in that area, and so I, I've, I've seen those farms, and they're huge. They're huge. It's all grasslands. It's all so he used, she used to go visit as a kid right up there for the summer. Oh, interesting. And she would help on the farm and ride the tractors cool. and all this. So she has lots of stories. Right. Anyway, we digress. I'm sorry. We're not digressing. We're, we're actually making connections right now. This is good. This oh. is very good. Okay, so... Are you my therapist? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we have to connect to the people that know a lot more about this subject than we do. So we're revealing to the listeners the extent of our lack of knowledge about farming. I've never worked on a farm. Ever. Not, neither have I. I have visited many farms in the past. Right. But I've never actually worked on one. So I know it's dangerous work, though, because, because you and I teach at a medical school. And we um, hear about stories of farm accidents and people coming into the rural clinics. And I knew a lot of students in the classes that, whose families were farming. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so you get these secondhand stories, and you can build on that and then uh, develop a picture of what's going on out there pretty easily. Who has the most farmland in the world? The most country? farmland in mm -hmm. the world. In acreage. If I say the United States, I'd probably be making a big mistake. But I think if you combined Canada and the United States, that would classify as the world's largest farm. Okay, North America. Yeah, North America. All right, so let's get back to right. the second green Right, right. So, so as the Industrial Revolution spread from Manchester, England, which is thought to be the epicenter for where that started, to other parts of the world, particularly to the United States, and then to all of Europe. Everything became mechanized. Looms started to weave massive amounts of cloth, mm -hmm. um, machines for other purposes, assembly lines, for instance, uh, the Henry Ford model for assembly lines for mm -hmm. the assembly of various other machines, uh, not necessarily for transportation, but also for, for manufacturing specialty items that uh, later on grew mm -hmm. into what we have today. So it's it's... It's remarkable to see how from one idea, like hand labor, that's inefficient. We can't make enough of this to keep up with the demand. We have to work out some other way of doing it. The next thing you knew, uh, when there's a need, there's someone to come up with the, uh, the invention to meet that need. And so we've, that's the genius of the human species. Whatever is needed, we do it. And so... In the ancient past, if you need a hand axe, you can make one. 
In the near future, if you need a bow and arrow to hunt with, you make one. And you know how many different cultures invented the bow and arrow? Absolutely independent of one another. Mm -hmm. A lot. Hundreds. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing how that idea occurred to so many different people throughout the world. And it revolutionized their hunting of uh, animals and their meat gathering technologies, mm. etc. Yeah, in science, everybody has it's, the same idea for the experiment, right? Tell me about it. Tell me about <laughs> it. So, so to realize that farming was one of those inventions that occurred to a lot of people throughout the world, that, that was the beginning of modern era of humans. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here we are. Here we are, 2014. Are we in the second, still in the second green revolution? We're still revolution? in the second green revolution, sure. And so let me describe some of the things that characterize the second green revolution because yeah. the first one was just let's farm. Right. The second one was let's, let's farm on a massive scale. Right. And how do you do that? When you farm repeatedly on the same land, it either better flood like it did in Egypt <laughs> when the ancient Egyptians depended on the annual floods for fertilization mm -hmm. of the land, mm -hmm. and they hadn't got a clue as to why that was necessary, although they knew it was necessary. And, of course, we know today that the plants that you grow uh, consume nutrients from the soil. It doesn't mm -hmm. consume the soil itself. It consumes the dissolved nutrients mm -hmm. in the film of water that lies between the particles of inert material. And that goes into the roots, into the stems, into the fruits or vegetables that you then consume. And it's gone. All right? It's gone, essentially. Well, the argument would be, well, yes, but you do defecate. And if you're a, a draft animal, say, for instance, your dung mm -hmm. can be recycled as fertilizer into the ground, as the dung beetles do in Africa. And so if you use that model to say, oh, well, now we have to add something back to the soil, Otherwise, the plants won't grow. And so we trashed a lot of early farmland because we didn't know that. So even at the end of the first green revolution, we still hadn't understood that you have to fertilize? Correct, because we didn't understand the biology of how to grow a plant. But it didn't, didn't fields run out of nutrients? They did. And the farmers would just not the Farms grow? failed. Uh -huh. Cities around those farms failed. Hmm. The cultures disappeared. So New cultures arose around other farms. And I heard a wonderful presentation by a fantastic agronomist turned climate scientist. Her name is Cynthia Rosenzweig, and she's on our faculty here. She's at the Earth Institute. And uh, I used to teach this Can we course. have her as a guest? We can. We, we, I'm, I, we have to have her as a guest because she's the one that can tell us which of the models for climate change are the most accurate for predicting where you can grow things of a particular kind of thing, mm -hmm. like wheat, for instance, and corn, Neat. and soybeans, and sorghum, and all those other crops that we are so dependent upon. Mm -hmm. Those are all temperature dependent, and the temperatures are changing, let's just say right. that. And, and the soil types are changing, too, because we alter them by over-farming. So C the second green certainly. revolution arose as a need for compensating for the loss of nutrients from soil. Okay, I was just going to ask you. Uh, it, it seems to me that to get into the second green revolution, we had to recognize the need to fertilize. That's correct. Right? Because you correct. couldn't do massive so, farming unless you did that. Yeah, but, but you know, look at, look at the genius of um, what you would call naturalistic populations of people. Do you remember the early days? Of course you don't, Vince. You're not that old. The early days of the settling of this country. No, I do not. I didn't think you did. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the legends, and I presume that this has got some basis in truth, is that when the New England colonies were first settled, mm -hmm. the Native Americans uh, made peace with these people, right? So we have a tradition called Thanksgiving, and that is based on the earliest sharing of food between the Native Americans and the settlers, mm -hmm. okay? And they showed us something. Remember, corn first arose in the Balsas Valley of Mexico, right. but spread north and south and into the United States. And so it became a, a, a staple crop of Native American populations, particularly on the East Coast where the farming uh, could be done in, in fertile soils like the Piedmont, for instance, right? So even in New England, the, the Native Americans were farming. Mm -hmm. And how were they farming? That's the point. They, thought, they taught the settlers how to farm. They said, here's the seed. Dig a hole. Put the seed in the hole. Here's a small fish. Hmm. 
take this small dead fish, like a Manhattan or a herring, and drop it in the hole, cover it over. The next thing you know, you'll have corn. And Oh, that's the fertilizer, right? Yeah, that's the That's how they did it. They didn't have to worry about exhausting the soil. That little fish was enough for each plant. (laughs) Apparently. Wow. But... We didn't listen. That's what happened. We didn't listen. Why? Well, what's the use of this fish? What are you doing that for? They didn't explain it. Yeah. So in many cases, there was a disconnect, (laughs) right? This was like thought of as a tradition rather than a necessity. Uh, yes. In many <laughs> cultures that, and you know, we rejected it in many cases. In some cases we didn't, but in most cases we did. And so a lot of the early colonies starved to death. Mm, yeah, yeah. And had to move. And when they did, they of course had to resettle someplace else. Now the hunting grounds, of course, I mean, we were much more efficient at hunting than the Native Americans because we had guns, right? So you didn't need a bone arrow. You just needed a gun. And it could, the range was much greater, and the killing power was much higher. Mm-hmm. So we could hunt, but that meant you could extinct a certain region from that game also. So mm-hmm. you could only hunt so much before you didn't have any more. So the, all these problems were created in the early days of uh, settling in the United States. And we tried farming in the Northeast three different times. Each time we did it, we clear-cutted the entire hardwood forest of the Northeast, Mm -hmm. and planted. In the early 1700s, we used the wood for housing. We used the land to grow crops, but the crops didn't do very well because it was rocky soil. If you've ever traveled throughout New England, you can see all these rock fences Mm -hmm. that delineate where the properties are. Those were done by hand. The farmer and his family collected the rocks Mm. one by one and built fences out of them. And they're still there. I mean, New Jersey has tons of them also. These, that's how you cleared the land. Otherwise you couldn't plow it. Now, you know, imagine how frustrating it must be to completely clear the land and plant it. And then you have a crop failure because the rain came too early or because it got too hot or because the animals came along and ate your crops or something else happened. And you say, this is ridiculous. And then you hear about the Cumberland Gap and there's all this fertile land to the west and it's easy to plow and it's got lots of fertile, you know. So the next thing you know, they abandon the northeast and lo and behold, the entire northeast forest returned. Hmm. Uh, Uh, Within how many years? Oh, 20. Wow. About 20 years is all it takes for some forests to repopulate, mm-hmm. okay? Because the seeds are already in the ground. All you have to do is leave the land alone. Yeah. So then another generation came along in the 1800s and said, ah, you guys did it all wrong. We're going to do it better than you because we've got more machinery and we can do it. But it's still the same crappy soil types, right? Mm-hmm. Same lousy uh, seasons, too. In the Northeast, again, clear cut all those nice reed-grown forests. Mm-hmm. This time the wood was used as fuel, it was turned into furniture, perhaps, and they tried farming again and again. It failed. That's ridiculous. And then in the early 1900s, they tried to, like, once again. And you know what they do now up in the Northeast? They let those trees grow. They're maple trees, mostly. Mm. A lot of them, I should say. And so maple syrup is a big product. That's yeah. an agricultural product. And dairy farming, which doesn't require a lot of land. Uh, so that's the main farming. Those here are the main the things they've got now: dairy farming and maple syrup production, and that's about it. Because if you try farming in most places throughout New England, it's going to fail. So why do you think that's an eco destination for people in the fall? It's beautiful. The trees all mm-hmm. turn colors, and there's lots of trees. And so, when you look at the repair of land as the result of abandoning farmland. Mm-hmm. What does it turn back into? What it used to be before you farmed it. That's the main crux of where we find ourselves right now. Okay, we're going to return to that theme a lot. Can I just make a comment? You bet. So if you drive through southern New Jersey over yeah. the years, there yeah. were farmlands That's there. Right. I don't know what they grew, though. They're quite big. They had some cranberry farms, and they did some corn. Yeah, but slowly they close and right. they convert them That's to right. housing developments. Yeah, right. They don't let the forest grow back. No. Because there's a need to house people. Well, yes. But there is no thought about where the food is going to come from. They assume it will come from somewhere else, <laughs> that's right? That's right. Well, that's that's exactly what happened. So we had to develop transportation systems, storage systems, uh, industrial harvesting systems right. to accommodate the demand of urbanization. So most people live in well, I, when, I, when I say most people, I'm going to rephrase that. Currently, mm-hmm. throughout the world, it's estimated 
uh, by Landsat photography and lots of other things that you can get estimates from, that over half of the people of the world live in a city or a suburb associated with that city. Mm -hmm. And the other half live rurally. Yeah. Okay. So getting enough food to the cities is what the rural world is all about. That's what that's about. So that's creating problems too, as we can delve into as we start into our discussion of what happened to the second green revolution. Right? So we're still talking about it right now. So the turn of the century, New England was given turn back of to the, the woods. Twentieth century? <laughs> yeah, nineteen hundred. Okay. And then um there are other deforestation stories that I could talk about. The, the entire Shenandoah watershed was cut down three different times. Mm -hmm. It was called the National Forest. It still is. And it returned because there were events in U.S. history like World War I, the Depression, World War II, where people were not active, they were not busy, they were looking for jobs, or they were fighting the Hun, as they would say, as uh, Winston Churchill is so fond of saying, the Hun. Mm -hmm. So... When we finished all of that activity, we looked around and said, where did that forest come from? Mm. <laughs> well, it was always there. We just never gave it a chance. So now the National Forest is back. And that's the forest in, uh, uh, beyond Leesburg. If you go to uh, the Shenandoah Valley and the Shenandoah River, you can see a beautiful forest there as well. And you can see the Blue Mountains with their nice mm. forests, etc. All those were cut down at one time, totally mm. clear cut. To and, try and farm. Yeah, that's right. To try and, and farm. And that's failed. exactly right. Okay, so the main so, farms now are in the Midwest and right. so also California. Has so there farms, was another right? push. Remember, right, right? Yes, that's right. right. Most farming is in the Midwest uh, for right. certain crops. Now, you have to take corn and soybeans. Corn and soybeans mm -hmm. are the, that's the king of industrial farming, basically, throughout the Midwest. Mm -hmm. that from corn, you can make lots of different products. From soybeans, we had to learn how to make lots of different products. So, Vincent. Not wheat. No. I why do you think we're a lot of wheat? Why do you think okay. we planted soybeans? Because we didn't know what to do with them to begin with. To fix nitrogen to fertilize the soil. No, I knew you would know that answer. <laughs> I knew you would know that answer. <laughs> yeah. Soybeans are legumes. Legumes, yeah. And they contain microbes in these little nodules in they the do. root systems. Yes. And those bacteria are special bacteria that can take atmospheric nitrogen and convert it to an organic source of nitrogen. Speak, right? friend, and enter. Fan. Speak right so um, let me just diverge. Please, we did a twim please. not too long ago That's right. on how plants, legumes, how the roots respond. They actually send out chemicals to attract rhizobia, the bacteria in the soil that fix nitrogen. Rhizobia, I so love they it. Take, they take atmospheric nitrogen and make right. it into a compound that can be used by the plant to make amino acids. Very cool. So they send out a chemical, the bacteria come in, and when they touch the root, it right. initiates a development program, pulls the bacteria in, and makes a nodule around them. So it, it, I read a review it's article fantastic. where they said, speak friend and enter, because the bacteria <laughs> is speaking friend, and it's getting yeah, in. And of course, yeah. that's from Lord of the Rings. Did you know that? I actually didn't oh, remember it. Oh, Dixon. I know. I'm, I'm culturally My, my twim <laughs> co-hosts did not know that either. <laughs> Well, you know, we, we we read different literature. It was actually the name of a review article on this whole process of really? rhizobium entering the root. <laughs> Speak friend right. and enter. It's it's Gandalf who says that to try and get into the, Interesting. the cave. So the Industrial Revolution jump-started the Second Green Revolution by providing the machinery. But other things also came along to help out. And one of those things was the invention of artificial fertilizer, which... Can you By tell way, us about that? I can, actually. It's called a Haber. You'll look this up oh, on the yes. internet. <laughs> it's a reaction. <laughs> it is a reaction. Two German scientists learned how to take nitrogen from the atmosphere and turn it into ammonia. It's the Haber-Bosch process. Right. I forgot the Bosch part. Sorry take, about that. react nitrogen Haber -Bosch. gas and hydrogen to form ammonia. Why would they want to do that, Vincent? Well, that's fixing nitrogen. It's turning do, it from a gas into to a... To do what with the ammonia? I think they wanted to make bombs with it, right? They did. They made ammonium nitrate. Ammonium nitrate was their choice of explosive. Okay? Well, now, this was what? done in early 1900s. That's right. So, is this part of World War I, basically? Well, it jump-started the uh, ammunitions industry. Mm. But it also turns out that ammonium nitrate is a great fertilizer it's wonderful in fact 
I'll give you an anecdote on this one because I know a miner. Uh, actually, he repairs large mining equipment in uh, just uh, south of Calgary. Okay, he works in British Columbia at an open pit coal mine. And how do you think they expose the coal? Blowing up. You, well, then what do you think they use for that? <laughs> Dynamite. Ammonium nitrate. It's cheaper. Dynamite's expensive. Dynamite. How, how do you blow? How do you ignite ammonium nitrate? Well, you you still need a percussion cap, right? And it's mm-hmm. packed into the soil into the hole that you've dug, right? And you just pour it in. And, and put a fuse on it with a percussion cap, and the right. next thing you know, the, cap the is shock d- wave is made of dynamite. No, the shock wave is made of gunpowder or something else like that. The percussion cap is yeah. made of gunpowder. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a, there, there must be lots of diagrams here. Do you remember the story of the van filled with ammonium nitrate oh, sure. fertilizer that blew up the federal building in Oklahoma City? Sure. And wasn't that the first <coughs> World Trade attack in the basement? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Exactly right. So ammonium nitrate became the fertilizer of choice. This is what I'm going to say about this anecdotal story. So they blow up half of a mountain to get out the coal. Mm -hmm. And then next spring in this area that looks like the moon, because there's no life whatsoever on it, not all of the ammonium nitrate blows up. Some of it stays as ammonium course, nitrate. And, and what do you suppose happens? Something grows. <laughs> yeah, and it, it grows over all the devastation yeah. that the coal mining industry has created. And they say, look, we've repaired it. We've See, repaired. let me just say that the nitrate, <laughs> ammonium nitrate, yeah. it's fixed. It's atmospheric gaseous nitrogen fixed into a compound. Right. This is what the rhizobia do. Bingo. Right? So the these roots. two guys <laughs> found out how that works, and then they imitated that process. And the next thing you know, you could now buy bags of ammonium nitrate fertilizer. It's not pure ammonium nitrate, no, right? No, <clears> it's, it's got, got some, some filler. Byproducts. That's right. So the modern uh, artificial fertilizers, and we're going to get into the nutrition of plants too, because this is something that I do know a little about because I've been reading up on the subject and been teaching it for a little bit. Um, plants need Only, and get this now, I know this is going to come as a shock, only 18 of the 92 naturally occurring elements, only 18 of those elements are required by plants, okay? But they require an organic source of nitrogen. They cannot, by themselves, if they don't have these bacteria to help them out, they can't make it by themselves. And what do you need nitrogen for? Well, gee whiz, Vincent, this is a biochemical question now. <laughs> you need nitrogen for lots of things. Amino, amino acids. acids. Amino. See, yeah. amino. Exactly. See and amino word? acids make up our proteins. This right? is absolutely So correct. totally essential. Absolutely. What's the percentage of nitrogen in the atmosphere, do you know? It, I do know exactly how much there is, 76%. And what makes it? Where did nitrogen Where does nitrogen come, come from? from? Well, I think it probably formed... As the solar system was forming, it came from stars that created the dust and all the other elements that condensed to form our current solar system, which is about 4.9 to 5 billion years old. Mm -hmm. And some planets ended up with a lot of nitrogen, like the gaseous planets. If you go out past uh, Mars, you know, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, all of those gaseous planets have lots lots of nitrogen on them. Titan is a floating planetoid filled or planetismal, I guess is what they call it, with (laughs) methane and ethanol, all kinds of hydrocarbons floating around in lakes. It actually rains hydrocarbons there. So methanol and ethanol and all kinds of other uh, organic compounds uh, exist throughout our solar system in copious amounts, and nitrogen is one of those. Well, there is a nitrogen cycle that... Yeah. returns nitrogen to this is true. the atmosphere from... This is very true. From the soil. The soil, right. This is exactly right. So it's part of the nitrogen cycle. and uh, That's why we don't use it all up, right? Well, it's there never used... Nothing is ever used up. It's just transmutated. Yes. It's turned into something else and then returned to the atmosphere to once again be incorporated. But we're upsetting that balance also by... Lots of nitrogen. Well, later on in this series, we're going to talk about. You could talk about the phosphate that goes in the ocean. I want to know. Where so, that. so early on, the um, the earliest versions of um, fertilizer contain urea. Okay, so urea. If you look it up, Voller, Friedrich Voller, V O H L E R with an umlaut over the V O H. I believe that's his name. 
Friedrich. He synthesized urea. He was the first. Oh, yes. It was the first organic compound ever made. The urea Volar. was the very first organic compound ever made. Before that, it was thought that you could Volar. never. W O with the with the two dots. Yes. What do you call the two dots? Volar. Umlaut. It's an umlaut. Umlaut. Yeah. H L E R. Volar. That's right. I never forgot that. Eighteen twenty-eight. That's right. Eighteen twenty-eight. He made urea. That's incredible. Now guess what? Now urea has urea is an organic source of nitrogen, nitrogen in it, right? And by the way, so was, this, was this before uh, nitrogen fixation by Absolutely. the other fellas? <laughs> Haber, Haber, Bosch. This was before yeah, that. Before so that. this was a way of fixing nitrogen, right? Not fixing it. It's a way of supplying organic nitrogen to the soil. And they by treat, the way, they treated silver cyanate. Huh. With ammonium chloride. Look at that. So you have to have ammonium chloride. Pretty dangerous reaction. Is it? Yeah. And what did they want to make urea for? That's a good question. To prove that they could synthesize an organic compound. It was the first organic compound. The very synthesized. first one. So could you make a bomb from urea? Of course not. Why not? No. Doesn't, that's not why they did it. It's not volatile. No, this was a theoretical organic chemist that was just no, interested okay. in... But, but by the way, before that, there were no organic chemistries. Could you put it in the soil? Would it be a fertilizer? They do. They use it a lot now. They use it a lot. All right. It is the single source of uh, liquid... I would say liquid. I wouldn't say liquid. I would just say it's the most important source of organic nitrogen on the Serengeti Plain, from all those animals that are all there eating they're, away like crazy. They're all excreting the urea, all right? Bit. Yeah, they're, they're urinating and defecating the whole time. What happens to the urea? It's recycled. It breaks down in the soil, mm -hmm. and the organic uh, nitrogen is then taken up by the plants. So the, the animals themselves re, are farmers of sorts because they want that grass to come back the next year so they can eat it again. So nature has wonderful cycles built into all of these ecological processes, which we would love to be able to imitate, let's say, in an urban setting to make our lives as reliable and sustainable as the lives of natural mm -hmm. ecosystem animals and plants. That's the whole goal. So the uh, fixation of nitrogen to make um, fertilizer. Yes. The name of it again. Haber-Bosch. No, no, the compound. <laughs> ammonium nitrate. Sorry, ammonium nitrate. Ammonium nitrate, which is highly explosive under the right circumstances. Okay, and that was a big It was a trigger big advance. For it was a big advance. Industrialized no farming. A big trigger. <laughs> for industrialized farming. That's right. right. It's, it's, this opened up the plant physiology side of what do our crops need in order to thrive, not just survive. What do they sure. need to thrive? Because because we can use up the nutrients from the soil without using the soil mm -hmm. up, of course, but we use up the micronutrients, which are essential for plant growth. And so we have to learn this. Now, as the result of even knowing that we don't know, right? It's important to know what you don't know, too. Yeah. Get this one now. This is a brilliant move on the. I'm. I'm, I'm, I'm United States centric in this explanation, but I know that there are plenty of examples of this in other places throughout the world too. But the United States, in all of its wisdom, in Congress, which hasn't been blamed for much wisdom over the past, that's true, but the wisdom of Congress said mm -hmm. in order for farming to succeed and to continue to succeed, we need two things. We need no, to know much more about the plants. Mm -hmm. So we need schools of agriculture. And we need technical support for these farms. So we need institutes of technology as well. Every state in the United States mm -hmm. has an ag school, at right. least one, and many, many states have more than one, sure. and an institute of technology. And, and the listeners out there know lots of these places because they've become famous over the years, right? Of course, yeah. Of course. Uh, let's just say the most famous ag school in the United States does everybody know what that is? Uh, I mean, I do. I mean, when I'm saying everybody, I don't mean everybody listening. That wouldn't be Aggies, would it? Uh, no, but you could say that. Texas Aggies, that's a and m That's Texas Agriculture and Mining. That's a combination of these two. Oh, so that's one of the most concepts. famous agricultural schools. It is if you use the word Aggie, but if you just mm -hmm. say, among people who know these schools, which one do they think is the most famous? It's United, It's University of California at the Davis campus. Really? Davis? Really? That's the one. Then there's another one, Vincent, which I'm surprised you didn't even well, think Cornell about. has one. They have Huge. a great 
School of Agriculture, yeah. a wonderful school, one of the earliest. Yeah. And, of course, where do you live? New Jersey. And what is the State School of New Jersey? Rutgers. And they have a fabulous agriculture yeah. school as well. And associated with those ag schools, you have technical schools. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, New York Institute of Technology is dissociated from the ag schools of New York mm -hmm. because it's located in New York City. Right. right? But New Jersey Institute of Technology, which is Newark, mm -hmm. is right next door to Rutgers, which has a campus in Newark as well. But right. you don't have to go too far in New Jersey to find everything. So you can just drive down the turnpike and get down to New Brunswick, and there you yeah. are at the ag school. Right. So there's a nice correlation between ag schools and technical schools to supply the know-how to continue to sustain farming in, in times where you really need farming to supply food for a growing population. So what you're saying is that farming became a science. Indeed it did. And it was supported Indeed. by universities and the and that would do research the government, the government. and train people to go out and <coughs> That's right. What do they call work. those far what do they call those schools? They call them land grant schools. Mm -hmm. That that's where that came from. Okay, so so the government recognized that it was necessary right. to that's establish right. these schools, so they gave them land. And every state needed one, and every state needed actually both of them. So every Does state, every state have an ag school? Every state has an ag school. Every state has an IT school. So we know some of them because they mm -hmm. carry the name of the states with them, right? So New York Institute of Technology is not so well known because it's a very small entity. Mm -hmm. But we know one in Massachusetts that's quite large, yes. don't we? Massachusetts Institute, Institute of Technology. Technology. I spent a few years famous. there. And I you did. did. I know you did. I you spent it with David Baltimore. Yeah. So there's another one out in the West Coast which partners with a lot of these other schools. That's Caltech. Yeah. So they call it Caltech, but it's California Institute of Technology. Well, there's a Arizona Institute of Technology and a Utah Institute. And there's a whole. But bunch they're not of all. Them. They're not all state schools. Yes, they are. They are all MIT state. is a state school. I thought it was a private school. It was established as a state school. It became privatized. I, I don't see. know when, but uh, so all of them were established to not allow farming to fail. Because if farming fails, nobody eats. Hmm. Okay, so so are you saying our government actually? Does some good things? Yeah, well, yes and no, because I'm, I'm assuming now that every state had a huge lobby interest in of this. Course. And there are some states that have much more presence in the agricultural scene than others. Mm -hmm. And as we discuss this concept further, of course, we're going to have to get to the Farm Bill, which is a big issue in modern times now. Every state has a buy-in to that bill, every single state. Uh, because money goes back to those states to support yeah. their farming communities. I'm not making a judgment on this. I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying it's bad. There are good aspects to it, and there's some horrible aspects to it. But the, nonetheless, we're stuck with that as a system. Got okay. It. So in the early uh, 1800s, this idea occurred to Congress. In the middle 1800s and the late 1800s, they established these schools, and they continued to generate this information. So that's where... We learned eventually when the scientific method was applied to the growth of plants, mm -hmm. for instance, we learned what the nutritional requirements were for corn, for wheat, for beets, for sugar beets, for switchgrass. You name a crop, a sugar cane, you name a crop, and someone worked on the nutritional requirements of those crops, okay? And they all came up with about the same answer. Every plant on this planet basically, uses the same 18 nutrients, mm -hmm. okay? Same 18 elements, elements I should say, right. out of the... Uh, yeah, I bet you can recite those. Almost. There's one that's really remarkably missing from a plant diet, which you would never suspect based on its inclusion into our diet. And that's the uh, element sodium. Apparently, now apparently... Plants do not require sodium for their growth. And we know from your experience with cell biology and my experience with uh, my brief encounters with biochemistry, etc., that sodium isn't a required element for humans to stay alive. We have transporter molecules that depend on a sodium ion in order for the transport mechanism to function. Interesting. Now here but I found... Plants do not have that. I found at Cornell University... Yes. Northeast Region Certified Crop Advisor website. Look at that. Okay. 
in here, and this is actually <laughs> what you need to know to be competent for yes. this field. Yes. Uh, the macronutrients, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, sodium, phosphorus. Sodium? It's there. Primary. Uh, 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 yeah. uh, uh, Cornell, uh, uh, ag school. Well, you know. Cor um, listen, sodium, phos phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, sulfur. And then micronutrients, iron, boron, copper, chlorine, manganese, Ooh, M-O, molybdenum, molybdenum, zinc, cobalt, and nickel. You know, I can read these. <laughs> How many does that add up to? I'll bet One, you it's two, three, 19. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. It says the 18 elements that are needed well, for plant nutrition. Sodium. Sodium's in there, dude. In well, the you, form of. Uh, you want to know what it is in the form of? I would like to know that very much. Uh, let's see. It's <laughs> actually not... So they have now below a list of essential elements um, uh, in their uptake forms, okay? Uh, they have all these things, but uh, potassium, they, uh, sodium is not on this list. Right. I wonder why. Right. Let's see if they say something about it here. Sodium is... No, I'm sorry. It's not sodium. It's nitrogen. You I, it's silly N. goose. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> silly Dixon. Goose. Sodium is N-A. I know. I know it is. I just this made... N I just made sodium chloride solution. You know Listen, what? Listen, you can fire me. <laughs> no, 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 Vincent. I'm primary new, uh, nitrogen. I'm, I'm sorry. I just misread it. I, I would have done the same thing. No, okay, no, fine. it's, it's that's uh, fine. I so do we silly will things. now back to the original statement that sodium is not a required element yeah, for isn't. plant growth. But what if we ate only plants in our diet? And sodium was not included. Is that why into we put plant. salt on our vegetables? No, no, wait. <laughs> <laughs> no, we want them to taste better. But the point is that plants will take up lots of elements that they don't need. Do they take up sodium? They will if you ask them to. In fact, there's one called salt bush that takes up a lot of sodium. It just Doesn't stores it, it yeah. though. Yeah. Right? Is this and why plants don't taste very salty? This is why some salt. plants can be very dangerous to your health because they will take up heavy metals and store them in their tissues. It doesn't yeah. cause them any harm, but if you eat them, you will die. Which ones? Oh, I mean, you can start with lead and vanadium. It'll, they'll take up lots of different elements, but they only need for their own biochemistry yeah. For their own survival, they only need these 18. So what you're saying is you should just buy your vegetables at the store. <laughs> what, what I'm saying, no, because if you do that, you don't, you don't know where they come from. So that, that's the part of this discussion is to know where your plants come from. Well, you don't trust Whole Foods? I'm not going to answer that question. Of course <laughs> I trust Whole Foods. They might be a sponsor. I trust them. That, <laughs> yeah, they might. I trust them as much as I trust any other purveyor of fine produce. You trust me? I trust you implicitly. Are you out of your mind? Yes. <laughs> okay, moving no, on. No, we're good friends. I can <laughs> trust you. I wouldn't I even, do anything to hurt you. Don't worry. No, I know. I know that. So the point is that that one of the issues of urban agriculture addresses the I want to know where my food comes from issue. Mm -hmm. The other thing I, it doesn't address, but it will eventually, is I want to know what's in the food I eat. Right. If you knew right now what was in the food you ate, you wouldn't eat it because it contains trace amounts of things that you know are bad for you, but because they're so small in amounts, they won't hurt you. Like but, mercury. Yeah. Like every time you go to a sushi bar and you order tuna, you can forget about it. It's there. You can, of course. You automatically know it's there, but you're willing to take the risk because sushi is really good, right? Um, and some people won't eat it because they know it's there. And other people say, look, I've been eating it all, all, my, all, 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 my, all my life. <laughs> right. So the, the awareness of where your food comes from and what's in it and the recent advertisement and uh, well-known foodborne illnesses outbreak network. Mm -hmm. There's a network that as you can go to the CDC and you can get a big list. The current and the ProMed is another place where you can go right. and find out what the latest outbreaks are in terms of foodborne illnesses that usually involve microbial diseases of some sort. But not all of them. Some of them involve the uptake of toxins into the plant itself and then you eat the plant. And people are worried about herbicides in their plants. They're course, worried about yeah. fertilizers in their plants. And they're worried about pesticides in their plants. So when you say I'm an organic farmer, it means you don't use any of those things to grow your plants, right? Well, guess what? You're going to take a big hit from nature because nature wants your plants. They want to grow back to a more diverse ecosystem approach. So the, the, the weeds will invade. 
But not in a vertical farm. But, well, we'll get to that. That's, <laughs> that's not in an indoor farm, not in a controlled environment. That's that's true. So we're working up towards that, but but we we don't, we don't get there yet. We, we want to get to the point now where plant sciences and the mechanized world mm-hmm. all come together and create what we think is a perfect world. That's what we have right now. No, no, no. This was in the 20s and 30s. The expectation was... 30, that, 40s, that science, 50s? When did it break up? Well, I'm going to get to that. Okay. I'm just, science wins the day. And we trusted yeah. science in those days to, to be our scientists. best friend. We trust science. We trust science, science, not scientists. That's right. Well, even <laughs> then, we trusted scientists, all right? So the, the book Frankenstein hadn't really hit the stands yet a big, <laughs> in a big way, but, but it did later. So we now had a perfect system. We had... You're, um, oh, and by the way, I must mention also the fact that the soil sciences were started not to know what's in the soils and where they are. Mm-hmm. Interestingly enough, the soil sciences were jump-started by knowing where hookworm is found. So this is a throwback mm-hmm. to my parasite days. In the South, which had lots of hookworm, mm-hmm. They were found in soils that were loamy and sandy. They were not found in hard-packed clay soils. Mm-hmm. So if you looked at the Piedmont, for instance, below the Piedmont, you have soils that were loamy and sandy because they were near the ocean. If you go above the Piedmont, you have hard-packed clay soils, and mm-hmm. that's where they were raising uh, other kinds of crops. All right. So if you looked at the distribution huh. of hookworm, it, yeah. it followed that pattern. Once they said... Heck, we don't have to look for hookworm anymore. We can tell whether it's there or not just by looking at the soil types. Wow, what a jump in in knowledge that was because it's easier to tell the soil types than it is to do a stool examination on everybody, right? Sure, sure. The United States States Geological Survey was established for lots of different reasons, but one of the big um, contributions that the USGS made was to then say, okay, as long as we've soil typed the South, let's do the whole country. Ah, So now that the whole country is soil typed, you can say, I live in Decatur, Illinois, and my soil type is a puzzle type soil, which is very deep and, and alluvial deposited, and mm-hmm. it's got very, here's the chemistry of the soil. What are the best crops that I can grow here? And the USGS will say, well, go consult your local ag Uh, department, right? Mm -hmm. So the United States Department of Agriculture became a science-based body of the United States government that served as an advisor to the the United States' farmers and told them what the best crops to grow based on their both latitude and longitude, but also soil types. Mm -hmm. So that that really became very sophisticated stuff. Now, that having been said, (laughs) um, despite all of that available knowledge that might have been emerging during the 20s and early 30s, there was another push in this country. And that was to settle the the heartland of Texas, Oklahoma, Colorado, Kansas, Nebraska, that, that general region, which we had pushed out mm-hmm. most Native American populations. We said, we're going to farm it. That's why we pushed them out, because they were prohibiting us from doing that. That was the excuse, but it really wasn't the reason why. They just wanted the land. Of course. So, so there was a land rush, okay? And the land rush was predicated on, I just immigrated from Europe. I've been pushed out of my own country by royalty or something else, by religious fervor. And I'm going to come to this country and find a new life for myself. And mm-hmm. wow, there's this land available out in the American Midwest, far Midwest. It's all grasslands, mm-hmm. and it's available. You can have 168 acres. If you farm it for three years in a row, it's yours free. Government you can have said it. this, you could do this? The government said you can do it. So they had land wow. rushes. They had boomers, as they called them. Mm-hmm. Boomers, right? Land boomers. They also called them Sooners. Do you know the word Sooner came from? Who are the Sooners? The ones who got there sooner than others. Yeah, right? but who are they? Oklahoma's. That's right. That's right. So right. What, why did they call them Sooners? Because the sooner they get there, the better. <laughs> no, because the land rushes started at a particular time during a particular day. Mm-hmm. And the people who got there before that sort of cheating mm-hmm. became known as the Sooners. Because they left a little bit earlier than everybody else. I see. And they weren't, that's really not allowed, but they did. But that doesn't matter. So in the end, 
everybody got a parcel of land. And it, it had to have two characteristics, right? What do you need to grow food? You need the land first. Need sun. You need sun. Water. Plenty. Ah, oh, oh, you just said the magic word. Water. Without water, you can't farm. Mm-hmm. So if you go to that part of the world and you look for water, you mm-hmm. better get there sooner than later because if you get there later, all of those choice spots will be gone. All the, the, the wells. Spots that have wells on them. Yeah. All the springs, all the ponds, all the rivers, they will all be taken up by people who know that if you don't have that water, you mm. can't grow what you want. Yeah. But oddly enough, during this time, this was like the 1910s, 1920s, mm-hmm. during these land rush years, there were, I think, three big movements out there, if I recall. But don't let my memory <laughs> spoil this story because, because the story is, is really tragic in the end because where all these people moved was prairie. Mm-hmm. And what is the characteristic of prairie? It's an ecological characterization. Dry. They could build houses out of the prairie. How did they do that? They just cut out a chunk of prairie and stacked them on top yeah. of each other. <laughs> Why were they able to do this? Because the root systems of those grasses were so tightly woven Mm-hmm. That it almost you could take the soil away from them and it wouldn't matter. It would still be like a brick. And they're dry. Of course they're dry. And that's why the root systems are so intense. They capture every drop of water and they store it and they keep it and they keep it until it's all gone and it's very conserved. Very mm-hmm. conserved. And the grasses, there are two kinds. There's a short prairie and a tall prairie grass. And the one that I learned mostly about was called Andropogon which is a grass that grows in very few places nowadays because all that has been taken over by civilization, encroached, okay? So farming started in the American Midwest, the far American Midwest now, as a land rush in the 20s, right? And just so happened to correspond to a very wet cycle in that area. And for the first 10 years, people were saying, wow, We can grow anything here. This is fantastic. We're going to grow so much wheat. It's going to be amazing. Wheat was their choice crop, okay? By the way, if you hearken back to the origins of wheat, it's in the Middle East, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's around these oases that we talked about last time. And that original wheat plant evolved through hybridization into the current um, hybrid wheats that we now grow as winter wheat and summer wheat and all kinds of other wheats. So there's this... Huge movement in the Midwest to establish the Midwest. And wow, it, it actually paid off. The government says, great, we've populated the area. We've taken it over, basically. Mm-hmm. And then something bad happened, Vincent. A drought? Was, the drought began. Dust Bowl. The drought began. This is the Dust Bowl, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But in the beginning, of course, it didn't look like the Dust Bowl. Yeah. Well, okay, we had a bad year. No worries. Then they had a good year. Oh, great, it's back. No, don't worry. Everybody's okay. (laughs) And then they had a bad year, and then a bad year, and a bad year, Mm. and another bad year. People are losing their farms, I suppose, and Uh, leaving and going to the cities to try and Do you remember, let's say that you were living in the East and you didn't farm at all. Something else bad happened. Yeah, Depression. Stock yes, market crash. That's correct. When did that happen, Vincent? 1920 something? Well, 22? 29. 1929. Ooh, U.S. Depression. 1929. Okay. Yeah, I'm bad with history. Yeah, 1929, okay. August, you're right. People were jumping off the ledges of buildings because they're, they bought their stocks with no money at all, and those companies didn't pay off, and they couldn't pay their loans back that they took out to buy the stocks to begin with, and that, that whole thing snowballed out of control. And a lot of farmers were And the rest is history, too, right? right. But in the meantime, of course, the farming in the Midwest continued to succeed, and everybody was saying, well, too bad about the East. Look at us. <laughs> we're, ha, ha, ha. And, of course, that didn't happen either, right? So in 1930, 31, 32, 33, the Depression just spread throughout the whole country. Wow. Jobless rate went way up to 25, 30%. Terrible situation. People were starving. Families that farmed, in which the farms failed, had mm-hmm. two choices. You can stay and die, or you can leave and live. You had a third choice. And many of them took that third choice. The father would come home one night in a state of depression that they had developed over many years of Mm -hmm. non-productivity. 
He could see his family wasting away to nothing. Got out the family shotgun, killed his family, and then killed himself. Really? People did that? They did that. And, you know, when you say that's a tragic, horrible thing for anyone to do, there have been many iterations of that from that point on to the present. In fact, when they had a horrible, horrible, horrible drought in Australia, just very recently, back in 2008, 2009, 2010, the same thing happened there. People were, they would murder their families and then commit suicide. Rather than A, have to move because this is their life. B, rather than stay and just starve to death. So farming has a, a, an effect on people that that rivets them to the spot, okay? And it's very difficult for them to leave. But in fact, there was no choice, basically. If you wanted to live, you had to move. So there was a mass exodus from the heartland of what was becoming the Dust Bowl right. to the Promised Land. Which was? California. Hmm. John Steinbeck country. So when that exodus finished, <clears throat> John Steinbeck, of course, grew up in California and wrote a, he wrote a history of this basically through a fictional family called the Jodes. And the book is long. What's the name of that book, Dixon? It's called The Grapes of Wrath. So they moved from the Midwest to California. They did. They moved from Oklahoma. They were Okies. That's what right. they called them. Okies. Not Sooners. Not Sooners. No, these were the Okies. Okay. And they moved tortuously mm -hmm. with this gigantic truck laden with all their family possessions, including all of their relatives, mm -hmm. to California, to the, uh, to the Imperial Valley of California, where, and we'll get to that because we're going to talk about the status of farming today. So this is the beginning of the failure of the Second Green Revolution, okay? This is the beginning of the failure of the Second Green Revolution because really what this did not take advantage of was modern practices for irrigation and fertilization, okay? Right. But it was still in the middle of the Green Revolution because they still employed tractors, they still employed fertilizers of various sorts anyway, but they didn't really have the technological ability to pull up water from a deep well. Mm -hmm. And being able to un, unable to do that meant that the water sources were rapidly disappearing. Huh. So there is an, a reservoir of water underneath all of that. Of it's course. called the Ogallala Reservoir. Okay? Mm -hmm. The Ogallala Reservoir starts up in Canada. And by gravity, just sort of feeds down. And it ends up as the Edwards Aquifer in Texas. And intercepting that aquifer with deep wells was the solution to the Dust Bowl's problems. Remarkably, okay, this was in the middle 1930s. So after many people had left. They all left, in fact. And then what happened? Well, 1938, 39, 1940, something... Really awful. Yeah, happened. World War II. It broke out, right? So nobody went back to that area for quite a while. No one. They knew not to go back anyway. They thought the whole area was just going to remain as a desert. There were dust clouds that were 600 feet high that when they swept across a small uh, settlement of people, it looked as though it was nighttime. Every day they would have to sweep out their houses. Every single day. Hmm. There was a very famous photographer, I believe his name was Weston, W-E-S-T-O-N, that made his fortune photographing people, destitute people, in the uh, heartland of the Dust Bowl. And you see some of these iconic faces of just absolute weathered faces, hard, hard, hard eyes that stare out into space, cold there's no humanity left in those faces. They are burned out people. They were defeated by living in the wrong area, trying to farm in a place where farming shouldn't have occurred at all. You're thinking of Dorothea Lange. Lange. Well, she she took a lot of pictures. She out took there. a lot. Okay, but Edward Weston was not the guy you're talking about. You don't think I was right on that one? Okay, no. I can be wrong. I did <laughs> before times. when I searched. Um, <laughs> Just for uh, U.S. depression, I got 
lots of photographs like this one of oh, sure. poor families oh, you know, absolutely right. falling apart. Absolutely right. And these are quite iconic. But Edward Weston was more okay. of an artsy Okay, type. I, thought, I thought you did some portraits also. But I, 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 Dorothy I'm, Lange also documented the Depression. I, I, I sit corrected. I love being corrected. So we should wrap this episode we're gonna try up because because and give us an arc for the next one i will give you the arc for the next one where do you think all these people ended up california right correct and that made its own problems let's talk about that the next time i would love to great and as you know since we haven't yet published we don't have email yet no, but we don't if <laughs> but we encourage them to write <laughs> and absolutely we do have an email it's urban ag right u-r-b-a-n-a-g urban ag at urban ag dot W.S. Right. You have a pick this week? Last week, you know what it was? <laughs> it was a map depicting all the earliest sites of agriculture yeah, in the world. that was a good pick. You can skip a pick this that week if pick. you want. No, no, I'll, I'll pick one. You want to pick a, a, one of these depression photographers? That would be oh, We could do that. Sure, let's do that. And you can send it to me later. Yeah, Erica Lang. Dorothea Lang. Dorothea Lang. I'm sorry. Let's see. Dorothea. And I'm not going to give up on Weston. I think he made some pictures of this. Edward Weston? Edward Weston, yeah. Well, I'll write it down. We can check later. Yeah, well, I'm going to do that. I'll, that'll give me something to do. <laughs> you don't have anything Not to do. Not that I need something to do right now, but... You can find Urban Ag at iTunes. You will, as soon as I submit it. Maybe by the time you hear this. And also, we have a website, urbanag.ws. Urbanag.ws. And Dixon de Pommier, I want to thank you for doing this. Uh, this is a pleasure. I love doing this. You have uh, websites about farming called verticalfarm.com. I do. Then you have medicalecology.org. Yes. Which explores the impact of the environment on infection. That's right. And that that's important. Exactly right. And then trichinella.org, which is also about farming, right? <laughs> well, it can be. <laughs> that's certainly a pig-born infection in this country, or at least it used to be. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to Urban Agriculture. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. See you upstairs at the farm. <laughs> <laughs>